Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. I'm MAPERS board member Eric Gould, and I also serve as a trustee of the Employee Retirement System for the City of Farmington Hills. MAPERS mission continues to educate our members and the investment community during this time of social distancing, and we've adjusted our format to provide you with relevant seminars, uh, speakers, and content over these past few weeks, and we are excited to announce that plans are moving forward to host our fall conference on Mackinac Island, September 13 to 15. Registration materials will be available beginning next week on MAPER's website. Today's speaker is Ron Temple. He's with Lazard and is the man a managing director and co-head of multi-asset and head of U.S. equity. In this role, Ron is responsible for overseeing the firm's multi-asset and U.S. equity strategies, as well as several, several global equity strategies. Uh, he's been with Lazard for about 19 years, with uh, 10 years of global experience before that, including fixed income derivative trading, risk management, corporate finance, and corporate strategy. So a lot of background, a lot of experience, uh, and I'm sure, uh, we will all receive a lot um, uh, from his presentation today. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic led to global mobility restrictions and commercial shutdowns that have wrecked havoc on our economy. Fortunately, central banks and governments acted quickly to put in place an array of policies to mitigate the economic damage and to provide liquidity and support to financial markets. In this session, Ron will review the current situation and outlook for key healthcare developments, policy responses to, and investment implications of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, a copy of today's presentation can be found on the events page of the MAPERS website. During the presentation, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please submit them using the green Q&A button located in the Zoom app. Uh, and we will do our best to answer all of the questions at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'm proud to welcome Ron, and he will uh, take over from here. Great. Thanks for the introduction, Eric, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, we've got a full agenda in terms of what I want to cover today. So I'd like to start off with just a brief portion of the discussion about the COVID-19 crisis itself with an update on terms of the key, key issues or milestones we need to accomplish to exit the crisis, those being testing and contact tracing, development of a safe and effective therapy, and also development of a safe and effective vaccine that's then rolled out globally. Then I'll talk about the, the economic implications of what has happened at, as a result of the COVID-19 crisis and the mobility restrictions, then the policy response to that from central banks and from governments. And then finally, I'll talk about the investment implications. So if we start off in terms of those three key issues around the healthcare part of this, if we think about testing, very few countries have actually reached the level of testing that's necessary. And what we've shown on this chart is we looked at the number of tests that have been administered as a as divided by the 1,000 people. So we didn't do this in a percentage terms, partly because there's a little bit of a danger of misleading people when you say percentage of population that's been tested. In that, if you think about the 21 million tests that we've done in the United States so far, if you divided 21 million by 330 million people, you would say, okay, we've gotten about six and a half percent of the population. But the reality is some of these tests are being administered on the same people repeatedly. So for example, if you're a doctor or a nurse, you've probably had multiple COVID-19 tests by now. So we're looking at just number of tests and the darker the blue, the more tests have been done, the darker the red, the fewer tests. The good news is as it relates to the United States is we're now testing about 3 million people per week. And just to give you a sense of kind of parameters from the experts, um, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who is the former FDA commissioner, has estimated that we would need about 3 million tests per week to begin safely reopening. Now, we just got up to that level, frankly, in the last one or two weeks. We're now testing about 450 to 500,000 people a day, so that's good news, but we should be very careful about overstating how positive that is, and that a lot of those tests are still being done, say, in the New York metropolitan area and not being evenly spread out across the country. Now, to give you the other end of the guardrails, by the way, the Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University has estimated that we might need to do up to 5 million tests per day to be able to safely reopen. So there is a wide range in terms of what people think, 
The good news is we're finally at the lower end of that range. And I think that can help us in terms of testing enough people to identify the people who are currently asymptomatic, i.e. they're infected, but they don't show symptoms. Because what we've learned over the last five months is that people are actually most infectious. They're most likely to transmit the disease two to three days before they show symptoms. And I do want to note, by the way, in the last week or so, there was some confusion because one official at the World Health Organization made a comment about asymptomatic people not being infectious. We believe from our healthcare team what was meant by that statement was that there are some people, I think it's about 20% of people who get infected never show symptoms. And it seems that those people who never show symptoms might not be infectious after all. But for the people who do ultimately show symptoms, the 80% of people who actually get the virus and show symptoms, they are very uh, infectious and do transmit the disease. So it's very important to test enough people to identify them before they show symptoms so that you can then quarantine the person who's sick so they don't go out and get other people sick. So on the testing, we're making progress. Sorry, that was longer than I wanted to go on that topic. As it relates to therapies, um, there have basically been there are two therapies that people have talked about the most from the beginning of this crisis. Number one, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Um, we recently got clinical test results from the University of Minnesota that pretty much have definitively undermined the idea of this being an effective treatment. There was a test, this was a clinical trial of over 800 people. Um, they were tested as using hydroxychloroquine as azithromycin as a prophylactic or for early exposure. So right after you've been exposed, and it was actually used for people who live with someone who was actually found out they're infected or first responders and healthcare workers. And what they found was that there was no statistical difference between people who were given a placebo and people who were given the hydroxychloroquine uh, treatment. In fact, the people on the placebo, about 14% of them ultimately ended up having COVID-19. And for the people on hydroxychloroquine, it was 12%. So again, not a notable difference. And that was the final major clinical study we were waiting for. And importantly, by the way, there had been other studies, but this was the first one that was actually a double blind with a control group, i.e. double blind means neither the patient nor the doctor knew which treatment they were getting, the placebo or the drug. And so it's actually a true trial um, with real uh, trustworthy results. So with hydroxychloroquine pretty much off the radar at this point, the other drug that has proven to be effective is a drug produced by Gilead. It was developed for Ebola. It's called remdesivir. Um, it was proven to be effective in terms of doing two things. One, it reduced the median length of a hospital stay from 15 days to 11 days. Number two, it reduced the death rate for people who had been hospitalized from 11.9% to 7.1%. So very notable results, but I would just caution yet again, two challenges with remdesivir at this point. Number one, it's administered intravenously. You have to be on an IV for five days in a hospital. So it's clearly only for the people with the most severe infections. And number two, with a death rate of still 7.1% for those people who are infected and hospitalized, that still implies an overall death rate from COVID of around 0.75 to 1%, which is about 10 times that of seasonal flu. So it's not a cure, it's a treatment that reduces severity, and that's a positive thing. Now, the good news, by the way, on remdesivir is this is not the end of the story. Um, what Gilead has announced is that they are trying to work to get remdesivir into a form where you can actually use an inhaler to take it. So they would nebulize the drug. You would inhale it directly into your mouth, into your upper lungs, which means you would need one quarter to one third as much of the dosage. And it goes straight to the lungs, which is where the virus resides, as opposed to having to go in through your bloodstream and ultimately get to your lungs. So this could be very encouraging. It would allow you to take it without being in the hospital. They're hoping to get that done before the end of the year. So that would, again, make more progress on the drug front. There are two other treatments, by the way, that have not been discussed as much. One is convalescent plasma. And what that is, is basically taking the blood from someone who had the infection and has since recovered, and, and obviously as a result of recovering, has the antibodies. The problem with this is you can only get enough blood for one to two patients from each patient who's recovered, but it might be a way of helping people who are most compromised. That is something we think has a high probability of being a successful treatment. Again, it's just limited in the quantities that we could use. And the other one that actually could be scaled is monoclonal antibodies. Companies like Regeneron are working on these antibodies that can actually be produced at an industrial scale. And this is something we're very hopeful can be deployed over the next few quarters. So again, remdesivir seems like one that will work with the most severe patients and over time could become more accessible. These monoclonal antibodies do seem like a promising treatment, but so far we don't have a treatment that can actually get a high recovery rate 
for the vast majority of people. Which leaves us last but not least on vaccines. On the vaccine front, just for context, historically the fastest we ever developed a vaccine for mass distribution was the mumps uh, vaccine. And that basically took four years to develop. Now that was about 40 or 50 years ago. The good news on the vaccine front is we have never in the history of humanity seen so much money and so many people focus on trying to resolve a health issue at the same time. The US government has allocated several billion dollars. The World Health Organization has allocated billions. The Gates Foundation, so there's tremendous resource on this front. And where we've seen the most encouraging progress so far is from a few companies, foremost of them Moderna, which is testing a messenger RNA treatment. This company, by the way, just for reference, has never produced a vaccine or a drug before in its history. So it's never gotten to the finish line in terms of production, but in their phase one trial, the results were very positive. Um, there were 45 patients. Um, in the early re release, all we've gotten so far, by the way, is the early release because the trial was conducted by the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease, NIAID, which is led by Dr. Anthony Fauci. Um, they did release, release preliminary information that the first eight of the 45 patients had actually developed antibodies that were equivalent to those found in people who've actually had the virus and have been cured. And so this was very encouraging. Moderna started phase two testing with 600 patients two weeks ago. Um, those 600 patients will be divided into three groups. Some will get a placebo, some will get a medium dose, some will get a high dose. They'll take one dose at the beginning and then 28 days later, we'll get a second dose. And over the preceding year, Moderna will watch to see if they're exposed to COVID-19, whether they develop antibodies and end up not having any medical issues. So that is the most advanced of the vaccine trials so far. Johnson & Johnson announced just yesterday, that they're, or two days ago, that they're accelerating their vaccine trials because they've had positive results. So we think those will be in phase three by July, as will Moderna. The other companies we have high hopes for are Pfizer, which is working with a company called BioNTech. Um, we also are quite optimistic about AstraZeneca, which is working with Oxford University. And then there are several other companies working beyond these four um, on vaccines. And having said that, uh, our most optimistic scenario on a vaccine is that sometime early in 2021, we would have a vaccine that could be produced in sufficient scale to start immunizing literally the billions of people who will need to be vaccinated. So from my conversations with healthcare experts, you've got 7.8 billion people on the world. You do not have to vaccinate everyone to get to herd immunity, but you probably need to vaccinate somewhere around 5 billion people. So this is a process that will take through all of 2021 and into 2022. Um, one would assume we will prioritize healthcare workers and the elderly people in nursing homes, but the vaccine is something to think about as a next year event. So having covered all of that, I do want to talk briefly about reopening, and maybe we can save this for Q&A. I do think it's very important as the 50 states reopen and as the European economies reopen um, that we watch what happens in terms of infections. And I am deeply worried that in the United States, people are assuming because the government has said it's okay to start going back to work, that everything's back to normal. And that is absolutely not true. The virus is no less infectious than it used to be. It's no less fatal than it used to be, except for the fact that we have remdesivir. And we should all be very careful about maintaining social distancing, wearing a mask, washing our hands frequently, and all the other precautions that many of us were so diligent about for the last several months. And what I'm showing you on this page, by the way, is to give you a sense of what I'm worried about here, is if you look at the vertical axis, we're showing the latest daily cases of COVID-19 in terms of new case infections compared to the prior peak. So looking back since the beginning of the crisis, what does yesterday's report look like relative to the worst day? What you can see is the, the states at the very top of the page at that 100% line are basically experiencing new peaks. And so you've got over a dozen states now that are new record levels of infections as of June 10th. Now, just to give you a sense, by the way, you can see uh, the size of the bubble represents the population of each state. You can see that Texas and California and Arizona are right up there. And one of my concerns about Texas and Arizona in particular is they have not been doing a very good job of testing people. And so what you're finding is the number of people who are testing positive for having the virus as a percentage of total tests in those two states is still in the double digits, so over 10%. For states that have been testing for quite a while, you're actually finding below 3% in many cases, meaning you now tested enough of the population that you're getting into the people who don't have the virus, who are not showing symptoms, that's a much better place to be. If you're wondering where Michigan is, you're right at the middle of the page, right next to Indiana and South Dakota, at a much more encouraging rate of 60% of the peak infection rates. So Michigan has made quite a bit of progress. 
And I'll, by the way, reference you at the end. We have some reference, uh, useful website links. Uh, one of them is rt.live, uh, is a website where you can track on a daily basis how each state looks in the last, most recent days versus prior week, prior month. And you'll see that Michigan, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut are amongst the best states in terms of what we call the r naught. r naught is the number of people who get infected from, the, from each person who has the virus. And you'd find that Michigan's down at about 0.85, which is a very good level to be at because it means for every person getting infected, they're infecting less than one other person, which means the virus would be on its way to dying off as opposed to states where it's over one, which means the infection ramp is still steep. So with all of this behind us in terms of the healthcare side, let's talk about what's going on with the economy and policy response. What you see here on this map is the darker the blue, the more uh, actively economies are reopening. Interestingly, you'll see China, by the way, is the darkest red, where they're actually reimposing certain restrictions on mobility as they've had more cases show up. You can see in South America, Chile down the left side, and Madagascar off the coast of Africa also tightening restrictions. But pretty much everywhere else in the world, mobility restrictions coming off of where they were before, which is very good for their economies in the near term. Now, I'm going to show you three slides here, by the way. The point of these three slides are just to show you the forecast for gross domestic product, GDP growth, for the US, Eurozone, and China. And what you see on the left chart of each page is the 2020 forecast. What you see on the right is the 2021 forecast. Two or three key messages here. Number one, you can drive a truck through these forecasts because we just don't have visibility. We do know that the US economy hit bottom in the second quarter. So we will have the worst GDP reading in history in the US probably for that quarter. But the third quarter will be probably one of the best GDP readings we'll see because all 50 states have started reopening. And if, as you reopen business, as a, a definitive result of that, you will have growth. So what you see on the left of the United States, the forecast range from the economy shrinking 3% this year to as much as 8%, uh, Merrill Lynch being on the more negative end of the spectrum, Royal Bank of Canada being at the bullish end. On the right chart, you can see the rebound expectations for 2021, universally positive view there. I do worry that some of these expectations on the rebound might be a bit too optimistic as it relates to each of these economies. Um, same story for Europe, just a more extreme slowdown this year than you see in the United States. And a similar story in China, except that almost every forecaster expecting the Chinese to economy to grow for the full year of 2020, regardless of um, what happened already with COVID-19. One other key message going back two slides I do want to point out, by the way, is if you take the, the average or the median forecast on these uh, numbers. So, for example, let's use JP Morgan. If you take their 2020 number, they're estimating the U.S. will shrink about 6.5%. In 2021, they're assuming we grow about 3.5%. The key thing to take away from that is, number one, again, wide range of forecast. Number two, even in the most optimistic forecast other than Royal Bank of Canada, the U.S. economy will be smaller in 2021 than it was in 2019. So if you compound out these numbers, this will take some time to dig the economy back out of this hole. And I think that has pretty important implications for state and local governments in, in particular. Now, those are the forecasts for the economy. Let's go through some of the kind of indicators I watch to see what's going on with economies. In the U.S., I think it's important to point out on this chart, historically, when we have recessions, it's usually the industrial economy, it's demand for durable goods, it's investment that really is volatile. And that's what you see on this chart. The light blue is consumption of durable goods, the dark blue is investment, and red is consumption of services. And the key message from this slide is usually that service line is bumpy, it's a little bumpy, but it's nowhere near as volatile as people's demand to buy cars or appliances or other big ticket purchases, which clearly in a recession, you cut down your spending because your income and your confidence go down. What's different about this recession is if you look on the left-hand chart here, we've shown you purchasing manager index data for the manufacturing sector. And yes, there is a very sharp decline, a sharper decline than we've seen in years. But if you look on the right-hand chart, the service sector is what really got destroyed in this downturn. If you think about it, when you have to be socially distanced from other people, it's the service sector that's most affected by that. It's retail, it's restaurants, it's hotels. And so you've seen a very different recession this time than in any prior period, including the Great Depression. Now, as we watch what's happening, this is just another metric. When we look at consumption as a share of disposable income from households, and what you can see on the right on the blue line is that we really fell off a cliff in terms of demand for services because people could not leave their home to go out and buy services. They couldn't go again to those restaurants, cinemas, theme parks. Um, you also did see, by the way, consumption of goods go down, but not nearly as sharply. And in the case of goods, people have been spending less and less of their income on goods 
partly because global trade has lowered the product cost of goods, and also because you always have ongoing efficiency enhancements when you buy a new car or television and set, you pay less for it typically relative to the value you get for that product. Unlike that in services, you typically see wage costs being a major driver of service costs, and that has been a gradual upslope over time. Now, if we look at the US even more, you can see here retail sales. And we broke out, by the way, the red part is food services and retail sales in blue is um, basically includes food services. We wanted to show though how important restaurants, bars, and cafes have been. So you saw the last month we have data for is April, where we had a 16.4% decline in retail sales following what was already the prior record the month before of an 8.7% decline. And by the way, we've included on this chart all the way back to the global financial crisis in 08 and 09. You can see in that period, the worst month we had was about a 3.7% decline. So again, off the charts relative to any of uh, the experience in our lifetimes, um, unless someone on the call has been here since the Great Depression. Likewise, on jobless claims, off the charts here, the worst single week of jobless claims in the history of the United States was 695,000 people in 1982. In this crisis, we had over 7 million people in a single week. And in the last 12 weeks, 45 million people have filed for unemployment claims. Now, interestingly, I show you the unemployment rate here. Uh, one of the biggest surprises we've seen ever for economists was last Friday with the unemployment rate, where it went down to 13.3%. Um, consensus was it would go up to 19%. We can talk about that more in Q&A if you'd like. Um, it probably should not have been a surprise to economists, um, given what we'd seen in the jobless claims. But again, we can dig more in the weeds if you'd like. Either way, at the peak of the global financial crisis, we were just at 10% unemployment. If you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics footnotes, they actually acknowledge that they think they might be underreporting by about three percentage points. So when we get to the end of the slides, I'll show you, I think we have seen the worst in the jobless rate, but that real unemployment rate, had it been calculated properly, would have been about 20 to 22% not what we're seeing right now because of just calculation errors and statistical processing issues. Now, this is another chart to show the same thing. What you can see is prime age employment. And by the way, what we define as prime age is 25 to 54 years old, is your prime working years, post-college, before retirement. Um, you can see the percentage of adults who work has declined sharply in the last two months um, to record low levels for men in particular, which is shown in red. Now, we do think these numbers will improve starting with the May numbers moving forward, but the real debate amongst economists and investors is how quickly this improvement will occur and how long will it take to get back to something even close to the unemployment we had in the last few years. And in my view, that will be a multi-year process. Now, other kind of metrics that might be interesting, if we look at the hospitality industry, just by the way, for scope, um, the restaurant industry, restaurants, bars, cafes, employ about 13 million people out of the 165 million in the U.S. labor force as of the beginning of this year. The accommodation industry employs about 2 million people. And what this shows you, by the way, is hotel revenue per available room. This is what hotel analysts look at when they cover the stocks. You can see we're now down 65% from a year ago. At the worst, we were down over 80%. And this is a combination of vacancy rates being very high, people are not staying in hotels, and the rate charged per night being down because hotels are just trying to get anyone they can into the building. What's interesting, by the way, on this one, luxury hotels have been the hardest hit and again, historically, luxury hotels have been a bit more recession-proof. The budget hotels typically suffered in recessions. It's been exactly the opposite this time. You've seen occupancy in budget hotels like, say, Motel 6 or the Days Inn or Microtel are ranging around 40% to 50%, whereas Four Seasons Ritz-Carlton, the occupancy rates are below 10% because business travel and wealthy people are basically shut down. Um, importantly, when I come back to the policy response, when you look at the U.S. economy, we really depend on small businesses. They are the backbone of this economy. Now, when I think of a small business, I think under 100 employees, maybe even under 50. What you can see on the left chart is 33% of all of the workers in the US are employed by companies with under 100 employees. And that's very important when it comes to the policy response, in particular, the Paycheck Protection Program that was part of the CARES Act was really focused on the companies with under 500 employees, which is half the employment of the entire country. Now, if we move to Europe, just to give you a sense, the European economy has been slammed just like the U.S. economy. New car registrations down almost 80%. We've seen unemployment claims rocket across countries. Europe has a different approach, by the way, to unemployment. In many cases, they have what they call short-time short um, subsidies. And what's interesting to me, and I think we could learn a lot from this, in the U.S., as you know, if you lose your job, you, the individual, have to go to the unemployment agency. You might be able to apply online but you actually end up in almost every state having to talk to someone on the phone to claim unemployment. 
And in the early phases of this crisis, it was taking people weeks to get through to that person to be able to start getting their unemployment checks, which caused ridiculously unnecessary financial harm to many households, in my view, because they had no income at all for several weeks. In Europe, it works differently. In Europe, the employer can go to the government and say, hey, there's been an economic catastrophe. My business has declined by a massive amount. I want to keep people on the payroll, but I need a subsidy. So, for example, in Germany, what you had is companies, if they had a revenue decline of over 10 percent, normally it's 30. But in this case, if it was over 10 percent because they relaxed the rules. The company could apply for benefits from the government. The government paid the employees payroll. The employees continue to be officially working for that company. But what's good about this is the employee had no absence of income and the company still has the employees. So when things get better and when you can reopen, you don't have to go out and look for someone to replace the person you laid off. And so I do think this is something we could learn from. I hope we discuss this more at policy circles. Um, if we move to China, we've obviously seen China had this all happen earlier. They exited earlier. So what we're learning from China, by the way, is what we've shown you here is the dark burgundy bar, maroon bar, shows you the worst of the COVID shutdown in January, February, and shows you the year over year change in retail sales, fixed asset investment and industrial value add. So that was the trough. What we're learning from the red and the pink bars is that there's a different kind of pace of reopening. What we saw is the industrial side of the Chinese economy reopen quickly, began because you can put people at a distance in factories, and you can also have people working outdoors where they're less likely to be infected. Retail sales has taken longer. And what we learned, by the way, is it really took about, I'd say about a month ago, the manufacturing economy in China was back to 90 to 100 percent of capacity. The, the services economy, the service economy had reopened maybe to 80 to 90 percent, but demand was still at 50 to 60 percent. That demand is working its way back up. We're probably back to about 80 percent of the normal demand now in the service economy in China. But that's very important because the service economy is 53 percent of the entire economy. Many people think of China as the manufacturing facility for the world, which is true. But it's important to recognize only 18 percent of China's economy now is exports. And so China is still suffering from lower exports uh, to the U.S. and Europe because there's less demand from the U.S. and Europe. But they're suffering even more from that slow reopening of the service economy. And that's been very important and instructive to watch. Other metrics we watch in China is how much auto traffic there is. And auto traffic, as you can see on the blue line, is back to the level of prior years uh, as people are going back to work. What's interesting on the traffic volume, if we look at subway volume in China's major cities, it's still down 40 to 50 percent. So again, back to that story, the consumers are going back to work, but they're still afraid to go to restaurants. They're still afraid to get on a subway or take a crowded bus. And so again, that part of the recovery a bit slower. Likewise, we also see here in the red line that coal consumption for power use is down almost 20 percent as of last week from the prior years, again, showing that the economy has reopened largely, but not entirely. It takes some time for that to happen. So from a healthcare perspective, we've covered that we've got some promising news on testing, encouraging news as it relates to Gilead's treatment and monoclonal antibodies, probably 2021 at best in terms of a vaccine. But we've got tons of money being spent on vaccine research. From an economic perspective, the good news is we are reopening. We just have to be very judicious about how we behave in that reopening, that's going to lead to a pretty sharp rebound in the economy, but not gonna get us back to where we were, say six to nine months ago, anytime soon. Well, what's been the policy response to all of this economic damage? Well, luckily I would say in the US, I would give the Federal Reserve an A plus. Um, in terms of monetary policy, the Fed learned its lesson from the 2008, 2009 experience and basically unleashed unlimited quantitative easing. And that, by the way, just to be clear, Typically, the way monetary policy works in the U.S. and Europe is the central bank will basically lend money to banks and will take collateral against that lending. So a bank could post treasuries as collateral or mortgage-backed securities and get funding from the Fed, which then gets into the economy. Quantitative easing is different. Quantitative easing means the Fed or the central bank is going out and just buying the assets and putting them on its own balance sheet. It's not lending against the asset as collateral on a short-term basis. It's going to own the assets. And what you see in this chart is the Fed has now purchased $2.6 trillion of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities in the last four months. If you can see the steepness of this bar, that is more than the Fed bought in its entirety through all of QE3, which lasted two years. So I would give the Fed credit for this because their immediate urgent action basically is like a defibrillator to the heart of the economy, and it reinvigorated markets, got liquidity flowing again very successfully. The Fed has also announced about eight major programs in this spaghetti chart, as I call it, Shows you on the left-hand side, I apologize for the alphabet soup, there's a municipal lending facility, which goes to state and local governments, a commercial paper funding facility, 
Um, there's a primary market corporate credit facility and a secondary market corporate credit facility, which are basically intended to get money to corporations and companies. There's a money market liquidity fund meant to make sure that markets keep functioning for short-term borrowing. There's a Main Street lending program, which goes through banks to get to companies that might not have access to the debt markets. Uh, there's the Paycheck Protection Program lending facility to fund banks giving loans to small business until they can get that money back from the Small Business Administration. And then there's the TALF, the term Asset-Backed Securities Lending Facility, which is meant to get money to companies for credit card loans, auto loans, dealer finance loans, um, other asset-backed kind of lending. Now, as you see on the left-hand side, these eight programs add up to almost $2.9 trillion of potential funding. Now, I'm emphasizing the word potential because what's been amazing about the Fed's facilities, only six of them are open, and the total amount of these facilities that are being used right now is around $150 billion. So they've announced that they're willing to go to 2.9 trillion, but only 150 billion of that has actually been used. And that partly reflects the success the Fed had in reopening markets. So people don't need to borrow from the Fed. They can actually go to investors for their funding. Now the Fed's not the only one who's been active. Central banks around the world have cut interest rates. This chart just shows you how much they've done in the last year. And if we also look at quantitative easing, the US is not alone there. Interestingly, by the way, over a dozen emerging economies have engaged in quantitative easing. That had never happened before this crisis. It did not happen in 08, 09, so this is new. And they're trying to, again, get liquidity into their economies through markets and basically ensure that they mitigate the damage caused by the downturn. So the central bank wasn't the only thing. If I had to give a grade to the US government, I would say it's probably a B or B minus. And the only reason I say a B instead of an A is timing. We've actually had four stimulus packages, or three and a half. The first was an $8 billion package that originally the White House asked for less than a billion dollars for. Congress said, whoa, that's not enough. They ramped it up to $8 billion to try to increase testing and get money to hospitals. Then we all realized that was not even a drop in the ocean compared to what we need. The second package was $104 billion, which was focused on getting people sick leave, increasing unemployment benefits, getting more money to hospitals and the healthcare industry. And then the third package was the big one, obviously, at $2.2 trillion, the CARES Act. Um, and then the three and a half, people call it, was more money for the Paycheck Protection Program through the Small Business Administration with more money for the healthcare industry. So this chart, by the way, summarizes that $2.8 trillion. It took us a while to get there, but I would say the size and the scope of what the federal government has done has been very good. I would rate that an A minus. I'd rate the timing something more like a C plus. Um, the one reason it's an A minus, the piece of this program that is still missing is sufficient funding for state and local governments. 20 million people work for state and local governments as of February of this year. 10 and a half million of those people in the education profession. And I do think, by the way, this has become way too partisan in terms of what we do with state and local governments. We've already lost a million and a half of those 20 million jobs, um, 1 million in the month of April, another 580,000 in the month of May. These are absolutely critical jobs to the safety of our communities and to basically educating our children and making sure that we have water, sewage, police, fire. There's a range of services, as you guys know better than anyone. And I do believe we absolutely need more aid to those state and local governments. I'm hopeful we will get a package number four for that process and also to try to add incremental help for the household sector. The rest of the programs, I think, have absolutely nailed it as it relates to companies. And likely, by the way, importantly, out of this $2.8 trillion, I want to point out that the Federal Reserve is a chunk where I have labeled as large business. $454 billion, that money is money lent to the Treasury Department that is being lent to the Fed to support all those programs I just talked about. I think all of that money will get paid back. And I should also note, um, there might be other loans that are being made to large corporates that will be paid back. So we won't spend 2.8 trillion in total, probably more likely to be something on the order of 2.2 to 2.3 trillion. U.S., again, is not the only country injecting money. You can see Germany's been the most aggressive of the countries in terms of fiscal spending and decreased revenues to try to encourage the economy. Italy, Portugal, Spain also being very aggressive. The U.S. is probably the most aggressive in terms of actual spending, which in my view is the most effective way to prop up an economy. We should have done more of that in 2008 and 9. It's encouraging to see that we've learned the lesson this time. Now, I said before that we would defibrillate her to the heart of the economy and markets. Um, what you see here, the blue bars show you the average monthly issuance by U.S. investment grade companies in the years 2012 to 2019. And you can see the last few years, last five years, on average around $100 billion of debt per month being issued by high grade companies. That basically slowed down in February as the crisis was its worst. 
once the Fed basically really engaged markets, you can see we hit record highs in terms of debt origination. 260 billion in March, 275 in April, 237 in May. Again, this is the most we've ever seen of corporate debt issued in three months. And the reason for that, by the way, is companies who are high quality recognize the pandemic could actually slow their revenue for a long time. They wanted to gobble up as much cash as they could on their balance sheet to make sure they could keep paying employees, keep paying their bills for as long as this might take. Over time, whenever things are better, they will repay that debt, re-optimize their balance sheets, and I think that will have been a very good decision. I should note, by the way, this debt is also at record low interest rates in many cases. The high yield market was very different. In March, you can see we actually had one of the lowest months of high yield issuance in history. And the reason for that is when the Fed did start its corporate program, it said it would, it, by the way, historically, the Fed has never purchased non-investment grade debt. It's never bought junk bonds, as we call them. In this situation, when they announced the programs in particular on April 9th, the big announcement was the Fed said that they would buy corporate bonds through that primary market corporate credit facility and the secondary market corporate credit facility. They said they would buy ETFs and bonds. They would buy any investment grade, but they would also, for the first time ever, buy bonds that have been downgraded below investment grade, i.e. junk, as long as they were at least rated B to double B minus or BA3. So by the way, the dividing line between investment grade and junk is triple B minus. So double B minus is three notches lower. So you go triple B minus to triple, double B plus, double B, double B minus. So as long as you were at least double B minus as of the date of purchase, and as long as you were investment grade as of March 22nd of 2020, the Fed would now buy high yield bonds. Well, that led to what we saw in April and May. Once the Fed announced that they would buy what we call these fallen angels, the high yield market opened up with a frenzy. The issuance in May was the strongest issuance we've ever had in the month of May in history. And as a result of all of this, by the way, what we've seen is the interest rate on corporate bonds has come down. What I've shown you on the red line here is the interest rate on the Moody's BAA bond index. So again, this is the lowest rung of investment grade. Did spike in February and March, but after April 9th came back down sharply. The dark blue line is the treasury yield. The light blue is the spread between the two. So again, the Fed has actually had great success in reopening markets. That has also led equity markets to recover quite strongly. Prior to yesterday's five and a half, six percent sell-off, we were literally five percent below the all-time high as investors had rushed back into risk assets. Now, I will say, by the way, here, I do think it's a bit risky and that investors, in my view, are right to be more optimistic than they were in March. If you think back to March, at the worst of the market when we hit the lows, the challenge was this. We had a pandemic where we didn't know what was going to happen on the healthcare side. We did not know what the federal government was going to do, because keep in mind, we still hadn't gotten the CARES Act. We had a Federal Reserve that still had, act, it had acted, but not nearly as aggressively as it ultimately did. So the markets had complete uncertainty, and that's why we had so much volatility and saw the market fall 35% from the peak to the low. Now, what's happened since then, we've got more certainty on healthcare. We do have Rendesivir. We figured out we're not going to overwhelm the hospital system in major cities. We've had time to accumulate more personal protective equipment. Um, so the healthcare side, our uncertainty is still there. It's still elevated, but not nearly as bad as it was in March. And on the policy response side, we had a flood of liquidity from the Fed and from the federal government, from governments around the world. And that is why markets have rebounded so sharply. My concern is, even though the healthcare story is playing out better than I expected even four to six weeks ago, investors do seem to be taking a straight line extrapolation and saying good news will all continue and there won't be any bad news. And I think what you saw yesterday in that big sell-off was investors recognizing that, wait a minute, as we reopen all these economies around the world, there is a risk that we do have a second or third wave of infection. And so I think there's a reason for people to be a bit more cautious than they have been. We shouldn't basically um, rush to the, uh, the riskiest parts of the market yet. Now, if I summarize it all, I think I've given you the economic summary. On the healthcare side, we talked about testing therapies of vaccines, um, monetary policy aggressive, fiscal policy aggressive, and again, taking the certainty out of the economy, which is why I wanted to address on this slide of kind of trying to reconcile Many of my friends who are not in financial markets at all will ask, how is it possible the stock market's almost at a record high when we still got a pandemic? And I think the key point here is investors are buying all of the future cash flows of companies. And when you're thinking about those future cash flows, there's obviously uncertainty. You know, you don't know if Apple will come out with yet another great iPhone and continue to see demand go up, or if they'll turn into the next Nokia or Motorola. There can always be things that happen with these companies. And so investors are always trying to gauge, what's the range of uncertainty? And as I mentioned before, that range has narrowed as the healthcare crisis has become a bit more predictable in the most recent uh, weeks and months. Also, 
as we've had more policy response, the range of outcomes has become narrower. And then last but not least, when you're thinking about all of the future cash flows, you're present valuing those back to today and discount rates because where treasury yields are, are actually lower in many cases than they were in the past. So you're paying a higher multiple of your expected future earnings. So, so there are a lot of things coming together, but it does make sense for markets to be much higher than they were at the lows. I just question if they should be as high as they are today and how we might want to be a bit more careful about our optimism. So how am I thinking about the exit case from this scenario? What I've laid out here is I really think there are three levers. One is how quickly do we have enough testing um, on a widespread basis across the entire United States? Number two is when do we have a, a safe, effective therapy that we can use very broadly and in mass quantities? And number three is when do we have a vaccine that's available that we can use for hundreds of millions, if not billions of people? You can see in each scenario, I've laid out those three items. The key thing, if you're saying, well, wait a minute, you just told me we're at 3 million tests per week in the US already. Why does it say third quarter when we're in the second quarter? The reason I've done that is I think 3 million is a bare minimum. I'd be much more comfortable if we were at five or 6 million per week. And I think that'll take until next month, which would be the third quarter. On the therapy side, yes, we have Gilead's remdesivir. I would like to see us developing those monoclonal antibodies I discussed earlier. Again, I think getting the nebulized form of remdesivir and those antibodies will probably be a fourth quarter event and a vaccine in the first half. Now, what I've shown you here, peak unemployment, 15 to 20%. The April reading of unemployment, if you read the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics footnotes, they reported a 17% unemployment rate, but they also acknowledged that due to some sampling issues, the real rate might've been five percentage points higher. That would have been a 22% unemployment rate. So I do think that was the peak. Um, this month would have been a 16.3. So effectively, we've already seen the peak. Um, but we would stay at these 15 to 20% real numbers for three to four months, two of those already behind us. So I think there might be one or two more months of very, very high unemployment. And by the end of this year, I'm hopeful that we can get to something closer to 10% in terms of a true unemployment rate. And again, you can see the other scenarios I've plotted out are either more or less optimistic on the margin in terms of those three toggles of testing, therapy, and vaccines. I do think there are going to be certain things about this crisis that prove to be structural, I do think we're going to have to do much more to improve the resiliency of our healthcare system. We, if we're going to basically rely on foreign supplies of personal protective equipment, we should have very large stockpiles available at our disposal at any point in time distributed across the country. A more ideal situation, in my view, would be for the particularly important equipment. It would be better to be producing that in the United States and to avoid what we've done before, by the way. For example, IV bags, when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico in 2017, 90% of our IV bags were coming from Puerto Rico. It's not very smart to have all of your supplies for critical medical equipment coming from an island that's in a hurricane zone. So I do think we need to have more domestic production of the most important equipment, and it should be spread out across areas that are not prone to natural disasters. And we should really reevaluate how we think about healthcare in the US. I do think as someone who gets my healthcare from my employer, that we should not get rid of that system, at least not yet but we must address the, the tens of millions of people who don't have healthcare because part of the reason this virus spread as much as it did initially is you had a lot of people who did not have insurance who were afraid to go to the hospital to get tested because they were afraid they would get the massive bill afterwards. And I'll never forget, for example, in the early days when a man in Miami did exactly that, no insurance, went to the hospital and ultimately got a bill for $3,000 for doing the right thing to see if he was infected so he could avoid harming his family and friends. So we need to really reevaluate this, and I think this could be a catalyst for reform of healthcare more broadly. I do also think households and companies and countries are going to come out of this with more debt. We're going to have to reduce our spending, increase our savings. In particular, I'm worried about the, the baby boomers. Half of the baby boom retired in the last 10 years. The other half is within 10 years of retirement. These households have seen their financial nest eggs hit twice in the last 15 years by financial crises. It's going to be very difficult for them to retire. I think this will have lasting impacts on their consumption and savings patterns. And the last but not least, I think more of us are going to work from home more often. And that basically has implications for commercial real estate and city centers. I mean, are people going to pay as much for an office in midtown Manhattan? I don't think so. I think there's going to be less demand on the margin for a center city, Chicago, New York, L.A. And so it's going to be interesting to see how this plays through. And I also think when people work from home more, there are fewer miles driven in cars. That's going to be lower auto demand. It's going to be lower demand for gasoline. So again, a host of different factors to consider as it relates to the after effects on the economy. Now, in the last two slides, I want to wrap up in terms of thinking about tactical asset allocation and strategic asset allocation. On this slide, what I've shown you is I, I think it's absolutely critical still to focus on security selection. Um, as you look at the markets, yes, the S&P 500 is only down about 7 or 8% or 8% now from the peak. But when you look at the range of stocks, 
We still have 100 stocks that are down over 30%. It's incredible the dispersion is within the market. The tech stocks are actually up from the previous all-time high in February. So there's been a lot of range here, and I think it's really important as you're investing that this is a great example of where passive doesn't necessarily get where you, where, where you want to be. And I think security selection in the debt market is absolutely critical because there are companies that are not going to survive this. I mentioned the Fed was willing to buy junk bonds, but only down to double B minus. If you think about those private equity takeouts in the last three or four years where there was massive leverage and where those companies were junk bonds throughout, the Fed is not going to rescue them. So I think what you're going to see is private equity deals where the value of equity goes to zero, where they default on their debt and the companies go bankrupt. And we've already seen some of those cases already. I also think that means in fixed income, you want to be really careful about what we kind of call dumpster diving, diving down to the lowest quality to bet on the Phoenix from the ashes trade. I still think now is not the time to do that. I still think you want to be invested in higher quality companies that are investment grade, where they do have access to that Fed liquidity funding in case we actually have a much bumpier road in terms of the recovery than people expect, in particular, if there's a second wave of pandemic. Same story is true in equities. I think this is really an important time to focus on what kind of, what kind of balance sheet companies came into this crisis with. Do they have enough funding to make it through the downturn? And even more important, assuming they do have the funding, do they have the funding to take advantage of the downturn? There are companies out there right now who came into this with cash on their balance sheet. They've been able to continue investing in CapEx, research and development, and they're going to increase their competitive advantages through this downturn relative to their peers that had weaker balance sheets. And so I think this is all about really trying to filter out who emerges from this stronger and who emerges from this impaired and has to lick their wounds for the next several years. So again, security selection, definitely critical in the debt markets and the equity markets. And last but not least on the alternative investments, as I mentioned before, I think there are gonna be some really big hits to some of the private equity deals that were too levered. I also think by the way, private equity is gonna find some really tempting targets to go put their dry powder to work. So it's gonna be a glass half full, glass half empty kind of opportunity set there. As a strategic asset allocation though, I think this is a more important part of the discussion. I do believe strongly that the Fed and the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan are going to keep interest rates at zero for several years. In fact, at the FOMC meeting this week, what was very clear from the summary of economic projections was that every voting member of the Fed, except for two, or every member of the Fed, not even just voting members, every member of the Fed, but two, said that interest rates would be between zero and 25 basis points through the end of 2022. So the Fed is telling you, even if the economy recovers, interest rates are staying at zero. They're not gonna make the mistake they made in 2018, um, and 2000, in 2018 in terms of having raised rates too aggressively. So you're gonna have yield curves close to zero, I think for the next several years. And basically I'm gonna call this yield curve control, whether the Fed calls it that or not. The Bank of Japan has called it yield curve control where they. They no longer said we're going to buy X dollars per month. They just said we're going to keep our 10-year yield at X, and we're going to make sure it stays there regardless of how much we have to buy. I think the Fed and the ECB are going to do the same thing. And that raises real questions about the role of treasuries in asset allocation. You know, historically, people bought treasuries for safety and for income. But what I'm telling you is you're not going to get any income. Net of inflation, you'll have a negative real return from treasuries for the next several years, in my view. If that's the case, I think there's much more of a place for corporate debt, and for securitized credit and other investment grade bonds that can provide you that diversification and income. It's not a lot of income, but it's better than treasury. So I think we really have to think about that. We also have to think about how much of that treasury debt or how much of that government bond debt is gonna be bought by central banks. I think you're gonna see central bank balance sheets get even bigger and stay bigger for debt for years to come, if not permanently, which arguably is monetization of debt. And I do think you're gonna have some countries where we really question whether they're solvent coming out of this countries like Italy, where the debt to GDP is likely to be 160% at the end of this year. So again, I think we're going to have to really reassess the role of sovereign debt. And I do think as a result of that kind of questioning of debt and what role it plays in asset allocation, we're really going to be rethinking equities. I think public equities are going to become a more attractive option because you're going to get more income out of public equities from companies that pay decent dividends. You're also going to find that companies, by the way, that have growth in the future, your discount rate on that future growth is likely to be lower in which case you're willing to pay a higher multiple for those equities. So I do think when we exit this, you might have heard people talk in the last several years of the Tina trade, that there is no alternative to equities. I think you're going to see that even more. And so I do think when we came into this, people got very nervous when the S&P 500 traded at 19 times earnings. I see no reason why it can't trade to 23, 24, 25 times earnings. And so I do think equities are going to have more runway coming out of this downturn, but it's going to be very important to choose the right equities. In terms of alternative investments, by the way, 
I do think if you look back over the last decade, Cambridge Associates has done some interesting work. There's other, been other interesting academic work. Private equity did deliver equal, if not slightly better returns than public equity, but not a lot better, especially in large cap um, corporate buyouts in North America. So I do think we're going to have to question what role private equity plays. I know a lot of state and local governments have been reaching more and more into private equity because of the appeal of not having to mark to market and those perceived higher returns. But I think coming out of this crisis, the ability to deploy as much leverage as has been used in the last three years is going to be limited. I think debt investors are going to take big losses on those levered loans, and I think we're going to have a reevaluation of risk appetite. So maybe they'll get better entry prices on their private equity deals, but they're not going to be able to lever up as much. And I do question if the returns people have seen historically are going to be as attractive relative to public equity. Now, with that, I've covered a lot of ground. The healthcare crisis, we are making progress. I do think there's, again, the positive story is we're deploying tons of money on the vaccine front. We do have a therapy that helps reduce the negative risk of getting COVID-19. It's not a cure, but at least it kind of cuts off the worst tail scenarios. Um, as it relates to economies, it's good that we're reopening, but there is risk when you reopen. Um, and I think we've had a great policy response, which has reinvigorated markets and helped basically avoid the negative feedback loop that occurs when markets shut down, companies can't fund themselves, they go bankrupt, and then they lay off employees. So with that summary, I'd be happy to take questions. I think we got about 10 minutes left. Um, I'll open it up and hand it back to Eric. Thank you, Ron. Um, and actually, uh, you, the first question that we got, you sort of touched upon uh, in, in your last few statements. And uh, it had to do with, so the question was, if we want to generate portfolio income above the rate of inflation over the next few years, do we need to turn away from fixed income and look toward equities? I think you started to address that, but if you don't mind yeah. expanding upon it, um, and I guess as uh, for those of us that are uh, trustees of the plans, um, do we maybe need to uh, revisit our investment policies and guidelines? Yeah, I, I, so you're right. I mean, I was obviously touching on that. I, I, don't, I don't think you need to totally turn away from fixed income. I don't think you really can, right? Because I mean, let's be honest, equities, and yes, I, I lead in equity business, but I also have half lead in multi-asset, which invests in equity and debt and commodities and other assets. Um, you know, when you invest in equities, it is a riskier asset class than debt. Um, and so obviously part of the reason why people historically bought fixed income was you had a diversifying benefit. And historically, by the way, there was more of a negative correlation uh, between debt and equity, meaning when equity prices went up, it meant the economy was better, but that would mean that interest rates were going up. So you would make money in your stocks and you would lose money in your bonds and they kind of balance out and vice versa as well. What's been interesting over the last number of years, we actually had positive correlation between equities and debt. So the more interest rates went down, the more equities went up. So you made money on your bonds and your equities. We've kind of reached a point where you can't get that anymore. We've actually, it's one of my, uh, one of my favorite strategists in Australia talks about, you got equity-like returns with bond market volatility out of bonds. So you kind of had the best of both worlds. You made money on lower interest rates and they weren't very volatile. But you've reached the point now where I think at least on the sovereign, kind of the risk-free end of the spectrum, you're probably going to get more equity-like volatility with bond-like returns. And so I do think it is probably a good idea to reevaluate re where you invest in fixed income. I do think, as I mentioned before, corporate credit will be more attractive. You're still, you know, by the way, spreads, even on the double A corporates, spreads are still materially wider than they were in January. So you can pick up some extra yield in the corporate space without taking a lot of incremental risk. Um, I would also suggest, by the way, I mentioned securitized credit like mortgage backed securities, asset backed securities have proven to be very resilient this downturn. Um, and then I would also note, Emerging market debt is something I think people really should look at. Most state and local governments in the U.S. haven't really gone there. You know, some of the more sophisticated ones have invested specific target allocations in emerging market debt. But I would note that there are quite a few investment grade emerging markets and they issue debt in U.S. dollars. So you're not taking currency risk. You're taking a credit risk. And in those countries, you know, in particular, by the way, when you think about that, that could be countries like Korea. Well, Korea has actually come out of this shining, I think. They've done a great job in terms of handling the COVID crisis. Their economy is still growing. You know, so there are going to be countries like that where I think it might be worth really kind of opening up the parameters of what kind of debt you're willing to own a bit, and that might be another um, option alongside treasuries. Okay, well, let's, let's ex expand upon that um, and talk a little bit about emergency, emerging economies. 
uh, and the risks associated with COVID-19. Seems Brazil and India are having severe outbreaks. China may be going back up, but um, seems like Australia, New Zealand, and other Asian countries have seemed to uh, have seemed to pick up and, and really do a wonderful job in uh, containing and reducing uh, the virus exposure. Uh, so if you want to expand on that. Yeah, that's, it's funny. I did a call, I guess, the night before last with our Australian clients and colleagues. And um, I said to them, yet again, you truly are the lucky country. I mean, the, the kind of nickname really does play through because they're basically at the point of trying to begin the process of fully reopening. New Zealand has gone, I think, three weeks now without a single new case. And so you've got really kind of interesting parallels. I mean, maybe I'll make a few comments. One is on Brazil and India and Mexico, I'm actually really worried. Um, Brazil, I think, is the most worrisome in that the president, uh, Bolsonaro, has pretty much denied that COVID-19 even is a problem. He's basically called it a common cold, which is complete rubbish. Um, he's discouraged people from getting tested, from having social distancing. It's, to me, a toxic leadership that is literally killing people in Brazil. And what we've seen now is Brazil is up to over 800,000 confirmed infections. They're number two to the United States, and they have quite a bit smaller population. Um, India basically has 300,000 confirmed infections. And the important thing to know about India is the testing rate is tiny. If you got, you know, in India, you've got 1.3 billion people in the population, and it's an incredibly poor country. If you look at the kind of GDP per capita in India is around, I think, $1,500 a year compared to the U.S. at $60,000. So the ability to even pay for the testing, you just can't do it. And by the way, the challenge in these emerging markets is even if you did have a lockdown, when you live in a favela in Brazil or if you live in a slum in India, being locked down doesn't help because you're living literally on top of your neighbors. I mean, these are people who are eight room to, a, you know, eight people living in a single room in some cases, especially in India. Brazil is much richer than India. So I do worry that in these cases, the, humanity, the human cost is going to be extraordinary. Um, I think the economic cost is also going to be very high. And the challenge is these countries are not rich enough to basically do what we've done in the U.S. and Europe. And they don't have a healthcare system that can do what we've done. The only positives I can think about for the emerging markets is typically they have a younger population. And so what we have found is COVID-19 really does disproportionately uh, affect older people. The death rates amongst people over the age of 50, 60, 70 are a pretty steep curve. Um, the good news is most of the emerging markets do have a younger population, uh, but I am worried about those. As it relates to China, by the way, I, I, I typically try not to question data from China on the economy. There is no question that sometimes I think the Chinese authorities play a little fast and loose with the data. On COVID-19, I, I don't think we'll ever know how many people really got it and how many people really died in China. Um, you know, it's pretty astounding. I think there was supposedly one confirmed case in Shanghai. That's impossible. And so I do think the storytelling got so far out into fiction land that we know it's fiction. Um, but it has been impressive how other countries like Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, have handled this crisis really pretty well. And one other thing I should say, in Hong Kong, by the way, they've also had a great success, but the difference with Hong Kong and Taiwan and China to some degree, they actually lived through SARS. And so whenever we had SARS, the avian flu, you know, basically they've lived through this before. So they definitely took wearing a mask much more seriously. They definitely took washing their hands and their social distancing more seriously to the extent they could engage in social distancing. Um, so range of data, I am worried about emerging markets. I, 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 I mean, honestly, I think, it's easy for us in the investment world to kind of forget about the human cost, but this is going to kill many, many hundreds of thousands of people across these countries, and it's truly a tragedy in the works. Okay, well, I see we're uh, running up to the hour, um, and so I think uh, I'd like to, on behalf of MAPERS, uh, thank you tremendously uh, for preparing uh, extremely informative and detailed slides, and uh, um, and we thank Lazard for uh, for providing this uh, this wonderful information and presentation. Um, and I don't want to speak out of turn, but I would love to have you uh, live and in person, or at, certainly at another webinar. Um, it was informative, and uh, and so thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we Thank really you, appreciate you sharing your knowledge. And for, I didn't mention in, in your introduction, but for those of you that were listening, um, 
the tie-in between the financial and the public policy uh, comes from the fact that uh, Ron just doesn't have a degree in economics, but he's got a master's in public policy as well. Uh, and that clearly showed throughout this presentation. It was wonderful insight. Um, for everyone else, please watch our website and your email for the fall conference uh, registration materials. Uh, and again, go to our website if you would like a copy of uh, the presentation. Um, and as you'll see the last slide that's on there, there's a bunch of uh, additional resources that Ron has provided. Um, I have checked out a few and uh, you could spend a whole lot of hours just going through that stuff, but uh, helpful information. Our next webinar, Funding Public Pensions uh, Post-Pandemic, Preparing for the Second Wave of COVID-19 Financial Fallout is scheduled for next Wednesday, June 18th, and you can register on the MAPERS website for that. Uh, and we would like to continue offering uh, educational webinars to our members over the summer months. So please continue to contact uh, MAPERS and uh, our wonderful director, Michelle Doran, Michelle Doran, to forward topic suggestions uh, so that we can get to work on continuing to provide our members uh, the greatest value uh, and benefits for the membership. And with that, on behalf of the MAPERS board, uh, we wish everyone, you, your family, your colleagues, good health, uh, safety, and a fantastic weekend. And with that, uh, I think we're done. Thank you, Eric.